Hi everybody, this video is going to be on section 8.7, the variation of parameters method. Okay, so let's um, backtrack a little bit to explain where we are. So using annihilators, and of course I'm referring to section 8.3 here, using annihilators, we now know how to find yp for differential equations with constant coefficients However, we were limited to the form of capital F of X, right? So where capital F of X is any linear combination of either X to the K, E to the A, X, x to the k, e to the a, x, sine of b, x, or x to the k, e to the a, x, cosine of b, x. Okay, so the problem is, what if f of x is not one of those three forms? We need to learn a method that works in general. Okay, so we now... discuss a method that can find yp for any f of x provided we know all n linearly independent solutions to the or to its associated homogeneous equation. Okay, so let's restrict our focus on the second order linear differential equation. Okay, so a second order looks like this. Why? double prime plus a1 of x y prime plus a2 of x y is equal to f of x. Even though we don't know how to solve um, even the homogeneous when these are not constant coefficients, um, what we're going to talk about now is just going to be a theoretical uh, concept, okay? So Suppose y1 of x and y2 of x are two linearly independent solutions to the associated homogeneous equation. Remember, the associated homogeneous equation is y double prime 
plus a1 of x y prime plus a2 of x y is equal to zero. I.e., this means that you know that yc is equal to c1 y1 of x plus c2 y2 of x. So what I'm going to describe to you now is the method, okay? The variation of parameters method is the following fact. Yp must have the following form. And the following form is yp is equal to u1 of x, y1 of x, plus u2 of x, y2 of x, where u1 and u2 are functions to be determined. So that's the first goal, the first, not goal, but fact we have to remember. We have to remember that the particular solution will always be some sort of a linear combination of the two linearly independent solutions, but not quite um, a linear combination because we have these functions being multiplied by them that we need to find. Okay, so here is what we're going to do to figure out a pair of functions that work. There is not a unique pair, but what we do is we create some constraints that make it possible to find a solution. Okay, so here's what we do. What we do is we start by taking the derivative of yp prime. Okay, so let's do this on the next page. If yp takes on that form, then that means that yp prime is equal to, using the product rule, u1 y1 prime plus u1 prime y1. And then the other guy is plus u2 y1 prime. Oh, no, sorry, that should be a 2. y2 prime plus u2 prime y2. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a constraint. So we're going to call this constraint one. So constraint number one is to take this part that, that I'm about to underline, that guy and that guy, and we're going to set it equal to zero. So constraint one is going to be u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2 is equal to zero. This is our first constraint. Okay, so now what? We plug yp into the differential equation. And come up with a second constraint. So I don't want to actually do that because it's a lot of writing. And just to save you guys the time as to what will happen, if you plug it in and you get to the very end, this is what you end up getting for constraint number two. Constraint number two ends up becoming u1 prime y1 prime plus u2 prime y2 prime is equal to capital F of x. And this is constraint number two. Okay? So if you're looking for u1 prime and u2 prime, what we have here is a system of equations. So let's write this on the next page. We get a two by two system. The system looks like this. Let me write it this way. Y1 U1 prime plus Y2 
u2 prime is equal to zero, and also y1 prime, u1 prime, plus y2 prime, u2 prime, is equal to capital F of x. This is what we get, and so we notice that this can be written in matrix form, right? What would the matrix form of this system be? It would be, notice the coefficient matrix is just y1, uh, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime, times the unknown then would be u1 prime, u2 prime, that's what we're looking for, is equal to 0 f of x. So what we need to do then is solve the system for u1 prime and u2 prime and then take the antiderivative, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to solve the system using Kramer's rule. So using Kramer's rule, what would u1 prime equal? It's going to be the determinant of 0, f of x, y2, y2 prime, divided by the determinant of y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. And if you actually divide those two determinants, we get the following. We get negative y2 f of x, right? Because on the top determinant, you get 0 minus that. And then on the bottom, what is that determinant? Remember, we called that the Ronskian. So this is just the Ronskian of y1, y2 of x. Okay, what about u2 prime? Well, if we use Kramer's rule now also on u2 prime, this gives us, it's going to look like this, y1, uh, y1 prime, and then 0 f of x divided by y1, y1 prime, y2, y2 prime, like that. What is this equal to? This is going to be y1 f of x divided by the Ronskian. Okay. So then how this is what u1 prime equals and this is what u2 prime equals. And so all you have to do is integrate those, um, find the antiderivative and you can get u1 and u2. So what does this mean? Um, let's go ahead and solve that here. This means that u1 is equal to the integral of negative y2 f of x. And you know what, let me just throw out the of x's, right, over the Ronskian of y1, y2, dx. And this gives us that u2 is equal to the integral of y1, f, divided by the Ronskian of y1, y2. So these are the solutions to how you find u1 and u2. Remember, once you find that, at that point, you're ready to write down the answer, right? Because remember, yp is equal to u1, y1 plus u2, y2, and now you know these guys. So you're able to write down the solution. Remember, the general solution will always be yc plus yp. 
So in this context, your answer will always look like this, C1Y1 plus C2Y2 plus, and then you've got the U1Y1 plus U2Y2, where these, the U1 and the U2 become functions. So these are going to stay, these are going to stay as arbitrary constants. These are going to be known functions when you're done. Okay, this is how you leave a problem as a general solution. Okay, we're ready to do some examples. Now, these integrals can get messy. That's the one problem with this method, okay? So um, let's see how these problems look, all right? So our first example let's solve the following y double prime plus y is equal to secant of x. So let's write down the associated homogeneous equation. We know we get y double prime plus y is equal to 0. This means we get d squared plus 1 of y is equal to 0. And so we know our roots are plus or minus i. And so we're ready to write down our yc. Our yc is equal to, what are our two linearly independent solutions? It's going to be c1 cosine x plus c2 sine of x. Okay. So remember, um, label what's what, okay? We have this, and we're going to use this later, but for now, we know that y1 of x is equal to cosine x, and y2 of x is equal to sine x, okay? So what does yp equal? So this means that yp is going to equal u1 cosine x plus u2 sine x. And we need to find u1 and u2. So let's begin by finding the Ronskian. The Ronskian of these two functions is going to equal the 2 by 2 determinant of, you put the two functions in here, and then you put their derivatives underneath. What does this give us? This gives us cosine squared x plus sine squared x, which is actually equal to 1. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to the Ronskian as w, just so that we can save writing. Okay. So what would u1 equal? Let's remember our formula, right? So u1 is equal to the integral of negative y2 f divided by w, right? What does this give us? Negative sine x, and then f is secant x, and then the Ronskian is 1. This is not a difficult integral to do. What I would recommend is writing this as negative sine x over cosine x, which is tan, and you guys hopefully remember how to do that, or just do u equals cosine of x to solve this integral, okay? And so what do we get? We get the natural log of cosine of x, okay? So this is gonna be the natural log of cosine of x. You do not need the plus C for this, okay? Because remember, any there's not a unique answer to this, and so any C would have worked, so it's better just to choose C as zero. We're just looking for one function that works. So what's U2 equal to? Remember, this is going to be the integral of Y1 times F, right? Divided by W. So Y1 times F divided by W. So y1 is cosine, I'm going to write cosine x, and then secant x, and then divided by 1, 
But this is easy, right? This is just one. You're integrating one. So this is just x. So there you go. We found our u1 and we found our u2. So this means we know what yp is. So yp is equal to uh, ln of cosine x times cosine x plus x sine x, right? All I did was I took my two answers here and here and I replaced these two, uh, u1 and u2. So we're ready to write down the general solution. This implies that y of x is equal to c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x plus the natural log of cosine x times cosine x plus x sine x. This is how we write our general solution. You notice, by the way, that this is your, just to give you guys the extra terminology, okay, this right here is your yc, and everything on the right side over here is your yp. So all of this, all of this is yp. And so you're just adding yc plus yp, and that gives you the general solution. Okay, that one was pretty simple just because the integral was easier to do, but really this is the method, guys. It does not get more complicated than this. Okay, so let's do another example. We're going to solve y double prime plus 4y prime plus 4y is equal to e to the negative 2x natural log of x. So let's write down the associated homogeneous equation. You get y double prime plus 4y prime plus 4y is equal to 0. This is the same as if we were to write it in uh, polynomial operator form, we get d squared plus 4d plus 4 of y is equal to 0, which is d plus 2 squared of y is equal to 0. So this means that r is equal to negative 2, but with multiplicity 2. And so we know what the general solution is going to be. So y1, the first linearly independent solution to this, is going to be uh, e to the negative 2x, and y2 of x is going to be xe to the negative 2x. Okay, So we're ready to write down yc then. yc is equal to c1 e to the negative 2x plus c2 xe to the negative 2x. And let's keep that aside. We're not going to need it yet, but we're ready to write down yp. So yp then is going to be, replace the c's with u's, right? u1 e to the negative 2x plus u2 x e to the negative 2x, and we need to find u1 and u2. Let's start by finding the Ronskian, okay? The Ronskian w, Remember, we're doing the Ronskian of e to the negative 2x and x e to the negative 2x, right? It's going to be the following 2 by 2 determinant, right? The first one is e to the negative 2x. Its derivative is negative 2 e to the negative 2x. The other function is x e to the negative 2x. And the bottom is e to the negative 2x. It's derivative. You do need to use the product rule. So it's going to be minus 2x e to the negative 2x. 
So it's that two by two determinant. So if you actually multiply it out and simplify with algebra, you get e to the negative 4x. By the way, you will never get zero for those of you that are scared because you are going to need to divide by this thing. The reason you know you're never going to get zero is that these two are linearly independent, right? We learned that in an earlier section. So that's how you know this is always going to work, okay? So this is what we get, and I'm going to call this guy W just for shorthand, okay? So this is our rod skin. Let's go ahead now and find U1 and U2 on the next page, okay? So U1, remember U1 formula is negative Y2F. So it's going to be the integral of negative Y2F divided by W, right? So what is this equal to? Um, this is equal to the integral of negative y2 f remember f was the guy that was on the um, right e to the negative 2x um, ln of x right that's the guy that was on the other side of the equal sign divided by our Ronskian is e to the negative 4x dx which is equal to, once you uh, do some cancellation here, um, because e to the negative 2x and e to the negative 2x on top make e to the negative 4x, so these two guys actually cancel with this. So what you're actually integrating then is just negative x ln x dx. You can do this integral by parts, integration by parts. If you were to let u equal negative x, oh, sorry u equals ln x and dv is equal to negative x. Uh, sorry, this iPad's not letting me write over here. So if you were to let this and then you were to let, if you were to let those two guys be your integration by parts, you would be able to solve this integral pretty easily. And so this is what you get for u1. You get for u1, let me just give you the final answer. You get negative one half x squared ln of x plus one fourth x squared. So all of that is u1. Now let's look at u2. Remember the formula for u2 is y1f divided by the Ronskian. Okay. So what would that integral be? Remember we have uh, y1 is e to the negative 2x, and then the other one is e to the negative 2x ln x, and then the bottom is e to the negative 4x, and then dx. This one's even easier, right? Because that's gone, all of those cancel each other out. You're just integrating ln of x. Again, do integration by parts on that if you don't remember what the answer is. It's x ln x minus x. Okay, so what does this mean? This means we're ready to write down yp. So remember, yp is equal to u1 y1 plus u2 y2. So let's write that down. It's going to equal u1 is what I wrote down on top here. Um, it's going to be negative one half x squared ln x plus one fourth x squared and y1 was uh, e to the negative 2x right plus u2 is x ln x minus x all that times x e to the negative 2x Okay, um, by the way, we can use algebra here to combine some like terms because there is stuff in common that these two have, right? So what do we get when we actually combine like terms? So notice this, this term and this term are like terms, right? Because they both have an x squared ln x e to the negative 2x, except you have negative a half plus one of those is positive a half. So it's going to be 
1 half x squared ln x e to the negative 2x. And then the next one is, those two are like terms also. We've got a fourth, but then we have minus 1. Right, because they're both x squared e to the negative 2x. So a quarter minus 1 is negative 3 fourths. So it's going to be minus 3 fourths x squared e to the negative 2x. Okay, so that's our yp. And so remember our general solution. We're going to take yc and add it to yp. So this means that y of x is going to equal. Remember, yc from before was c1 e to the negative 2x plus c2 x e to the negative 2x plus, and then I'm going to write down my That is my general solution. Now, notice that we've had some fairly simple capital F of X's, right? But what happens if it's more complicated? Um, I want to give you two scenarios to think about, okay? So I'll just call these remarks. So remark one. What happens if capital F of X is more complicated? So if your differential equation is Ly is equal to F1 of X plus F2 of X. Let's say you actually have two functions added together. Can you do them separately? Or do you have to consider that as one big F, okay? Yes, you can do it separately. And so what you're going to do is you're going to find yc by solving the associated homogeneous equation, which is ly is equal to 0, 2. What you can do is you can find y, we're going to call it yp1, particular solution 1 for ly is equal to f1 of x. And so what you do is pretend like the f2 isn't even there and solve that differential equation. Then you're going to find yp2 for ly is equal to f2 of x. And then finally, what will yp be? yp will equal to yp1 plus yp2 for ly is equal to f1 of x plus f2 of x. Okay, so the idea is that we can find the particular solutions for each function on the right separately if there's more than one. So let me just say the integrals... can get nasty. So finding yp's for smaller pieces can be more convenient. Okay. Um, let me give another remark, okay? So even though we learn this method, it doesn't mean it's always the best, the best method to use. So if capital F of X is one of the three forms mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, using the annihilator method,
to find why p is usually faster or easier, depending on how you think about it. Okay, so what I'm saying is we just found a, made, a way that always works. However, it doesn't mean that it's always the fastest way. If you notice it's the familiar form, considering annihilators is usually the easiest. So let's put these two remarks into practice. I'm going to uh, do another example. I want us to solve the following differential equation. We're going to have y double prime plus 9y is equal to 6 cotan squared of 3x plus 5e to the 2x. And they tell us that x lives from 0 to pi over 6. Okay. Let's start by, and you can notice that the right side is very complicated here, okay? But it's not going to be as bad as you think. Let's start with the associated homogeneous equation, okay? The associated homogeneous equation is y double prime plus 9y is equal to 0, which is the same as d squared plus 9 of y is equal to 0. So we know that this leads us to complex roots, right? Plus or minus 3i. So then this means that y1 of x is equal to our two linearly independent solutions are cosine of 3x and y2 of x is equal to sine of 3x. Okay? So we're ready to write down yc. So yc is equal to c1 cosine of 3x plus c2 sine of 3x. This is our complementary function, okay? So I'm going to save this guy for later, okay? Now what, okay? We need to find the particular. However, um, looking at my original problem, we've got the sum of two functions on the right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this guy and this guy separately. I'm going to call this guy F1, and I'm going to call this guy capital F2. So let's start with F1. Okay, Each one is going to have its own particular function. So let's start with F1 then. So I'm going to call that YP1. So we're going to find YP1 for y double prime plus 9y is equal to 6 cotan squared 3x, right? You notice I'm losing the other side there, okay? So I know that yp1 is going to equal u1 cosine of 3x plus u2 sine of 3x. And I need to find u1 and u2 using... In this case, I have no choice but to use the variation of parameters method because that's not one of the three familiar forms, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to write down the Ronskian. So W, remember W is the Ronskian, and I'm going to do the Ronskian of our two functions. We've got cosine of 3x. We've got sine of 3x. Their two derivatives are going to go underneath, so that's um, negative 3 sine of 3x. Oh, sorry. I'm doing this on the wrong line. Um, you know what? Yeah, let's just jump to the determinant, right? I'm writing too much here. It's going to be the determinant of those derivatives, right? So if you take that determinant and you work through the algebra and use the identity, you just get 3 because it's 3 cos squared plus 3 sine squared, which gives you 3. Okay. Um, let's find u1 and u2 for this, okay? So let's start with u1. Let me go to the next page here. u1 is going to equal, remember it's going to be negative y2 times, we're doing f1 in this case, right? We're not doing f2 at all. 
divided by w dx. And this is equal to, we have negative sine of 3x times 6 cotan squared of 3x all over 3 dx. Okay. After taking out constants um, and rewriting the top, okay, we actually get the following integral that we need to solve. Okay, you can simplify. Um, you could pull out a negative two, okay, and what we're left with inside. After lots of playing with it, you get cosecant of three x minus sine of three x dx. Okay. And so what you end up with when you work out your integral is the following. It's a little bit long, but this is what you get. You get negative 2 thirds uh, ln of cosecant 3x minus cotan 3x. Now, do we need the absolute value, actually, of that? No, because cosecant 3x minus cotan 3x is actually positive based on where our x lives, right? Because x lives between 0 and uh, pi over 6. So this is what you get. Cosecant 3x minus cotan of 3x plus 2 thirds cosine of 3x. So this is what we get for u1. Now, what about u2? It's going to be the integral of y1 f1 divided by w, right? So what is this equal to? This is going to equal u1 is cosine 3x, and then we have a 6 cotan squared of 3x and then we're dividing by 3, right? Okay, after using some identities and all of that good stuff, we get to the answer here. Um, the answer ends up being let me write it actually below. The answer ends up being negative 2 thirds cosecant 3x minus 2 thirds sine of 3x. Okay, so we can write down yp1 then. So yp1, remember that's equal to u1y1 plus u2y2, which is equal to negative two-thirds times natural log of cosecant 3x minus cotan 3x plus two-thirds cosine 3x all that times y1 which is another cosine 3x right So actually, sorry, I thought of a better way of writing this. I can write this times cosine 3x plus, oh, sorry, minus Sorry, looking over my notes, I made a sign mistake earlier. Um, this should be over here. This should be a minus. So let me fix that to a minus two thirds cosine of 3x. Um, so this is going to be a minus here again. Um, I get minus 2 thirds cosine squared of 3x, right? So what I did was that just there is u1, y1. So what would u2, y2 be? Well, I got u2 on that second line, and then it's going to be times y2. Remember, y2 was sine 
sine of 3x, right? So I'm going to multiply that out. So if you multiply sine times cosecant, so what I'm doing now is I'm taking all of u2 and multiplying it by sine of 3x. So this gives us minus 2 thirds cosecant 3x times sine of 3x. It just goes away. And then the next one's going to be minus 2 thirds sine squared of 3x. Okay, all of this is yp1. So it seems like we're only halfway done with the question, right? Because we still have that other capital F to worry about. Okay. Um, by the way, yes, you can do algebra to simplify this a tiny bit, um, which I can do. So look, let me just do that because it's nice the way this works out. I've got a minus two thirds cos squared here, and then I've got a minus two thirds sine squared here. So if you take out a minus two thirds from that, you actually get um, you actually get negative two thirds altogether, and then combined with the other negative two thirds is minus four thirds. So let me cross this out, this out, and this out, and instead it's going to be minus four thirds. Okay. So this is my yp1. Now what about yp2? Well for this I want to solve the other part of this, right? Remember we have y double prime plus 9y is equal to 5e to the 2x. However, it should be clear to you that the annihilator's method is going to be quite simple for this one, right? So let's do the annihilator to find yp2. What annihilates this guy? d minus 2 annihilates, remember we called this f2, so I'm going to call it f2 again. And so what we end up with is d minus 2 d squared plus 9 of y is equal to 0. So the only new part that we're going to get for yp2 is going to be from this d minus 2 part, right? Because the rest is contained in the yc. Okay, so we don't need to write the cosine and the sine that come from this factor on the right. All we need to worry about is this factor right here. Okay, so what's yp2 going to be? Remember our trial solution is a naught e to the 2 x a naught e to the 2 x so let's go ahead and take some derivatives and plug it in so what is y p2 prime it's just 2 a naught e to the 2 x and y p2 double prime is 4 a naught e to the 2 x so if we plug it into star So plug into star, we get the following, y double prime, so it's going to be 4a naught e to the 2x plus 9y plus 9a naught e to the 2x has to equal 5e to the 2x. So this leads us to 13a naught is equal to 5 or a naught is 5 over 13. See, this is much easier than using variation of parameters. So this means that yp2 is going to equal 5 thirteenths e to the 2x. So we're ready to write down our final answer, right? What is our final answer going to be? So our general solution is yc plus yp but remember, we broke down yp into yp1 plus yp2. So our general solution, if we put everything together, is y of x is equal to, remember, first we had c1 cosine of 3x plus c2 sine of 3x. Then I had y of p1, so I'm going to write that. 
um, minus two thirds cosine of three x ln of cosecant three x minus cotan three x minus four thirds and then plus five thirteenths e to the two x, which I got from my last part. And this entire thing would be the general solution. Okay, I hope I did enough examples for this idea to sink in. Um, last thing I wanna write down is, um, I'm not gonna do any more examples, but I just wanna write down a couple of lines for you to think about, okay? Notice we said this method applies to nth order, except everything we did was with a second order. So how would you extend this idea to higher orders? So let me just say the process can be extended to nth order linear differential equations as follows. First, of course, you're going to find, so suppose Ly equals zero yields n linearly independent solutions and um, the solutions are y1 all the way to yn. So in other words, yc would be a linear combination of those, right? All you have to do is then you solve the following system of equations. So what you're going to need to do is take lots more derivatives of y n minus 1 derivatives there and then u1 prime to un prime is equal to, and then these are all going to be zero until the very last one. What you do is you create lots of constraints here, and the only one that isn't zero is the bottom. Okay? So your answer after you solve this system that gives you all the u's, so then yp would equal u1y1 plus un. YN. You're never really going to have problems that are bigger than second order in this class just because it's too much work. As you saw, even doing a two by two can be um, really, really strenuous by hand. But this is important for you to understand theoretically that this method does extend, right? It just would become a three by three Ron scan, right? To use Kramer's rule to solve three variables. Lots more work, but it can be done. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching.